Hello, everyone from around the world tuning in for the Y7. Thank you for joining us. My name is Benjamin Lutz, and I'm the lead on Delegate Success for the Y7 Summit. I'm also the Director of Membership at Young Professionals in Foreign Policy, also known as YPSP. YPSP works to build the leaders tomorrow need. We do this by providing YPSP members with capacity building programs, engaging events, a global community of peers, and opportunities to elevate their voices through writing and publication. We are delighted to have the United Arab Emirates Minister of State for Youth Affairs, Her Excellency Shama al mazri to join the Y7 Summit to discuss the importance of youth involvement in foreign affairs and in creating more inclusive communities. Minister al mazri and the UAE Embassy have been important partners for YPFP. They share the YPFP's interest in engaging the next generation of leaders to build a more connected and peaceful future. Before I introduce the minister, I have a few housekeeping points. After a brief conversation with myself and Minister al mazri I'll turn to the audience for questions. Please submit your questions through the chat function at the bottom of your screen. One of my YPSP colleagues will sort the questions and pass them on to me as moderator. Please remain muted to avoid background noise and limit interruption. It is my great honor to introduce Her Excellency Shama bin Suhail bin Faris al Madrubi. She was appointed as the UAE Minister of State for Youth Affairs in February of 2016 at 22 years old, making her the world's youngest cabinet minister. Her Excellency Al Mazrudi is also the chair of the Emirates Youth Council and Federal Youth Authority, as well as the vice chair of the Arab Youth Center, covering over 15 initiatives across 22 Middle East and North African nations. She serves as the chairperson for the Special Olympics UAE spearheading the largest delegation of athletes during the Middle East's first World Games in 2019 and championing inclusion throughout the Arab world. Minister al mazrui is a Rhodes Scholar, and soon after graduating with her master's degree, she began the important work at the Ministry of Youth. The UAE is experiencing a demographic youth bulge, meaning a large majority of the UAE's population is youth, nearly 49%. Her focus has been on providing and amplifying the voices of Emirati youth to ensure a stronger future for the large majority of the UAE citizenry. Minister al mazrui we are delighted to have you join us today to talk about your dynamic role as the UAE Minister of State for Youth Affairs at this Y7 Summit. Thank you very much, Benjamin, and thank you for inviting me. Um, to all of you tuning in, I'm so honored to speak with you about the issues that make up a big part of my work. I look forward to hearing from you as well. I think we're going to be uh, one another's teachers today. As, uh, you've been, as Benjamin eloquently so said, the focus of my mandate is to make sure that youth voices are heard and that their ideas and talents reverberate through the corridors of power and decision-making spaces. I believe so deeply in the YPSC mission um, to build the leaders tomorrow needs. And I want to start by saying that you youth are the essential ingredient that the world needs. At a time when we are facing such a difficult global crisis, the need for international cooperation through forums like the G7 is paramount. And Y7 Summit plays such a crucial complementary role. Your convening here carries more weight than you may realize. I think the reality that young people like us will shape the future of the world is a fact, and there's no time like the present to begin doing so. Um, an example I think that was illustrated perfectly clearly is um, the UK's Brexit um, on the referendum. Um, I remember Foreign Policy magazine reporting that older generations voted leave, while younger generations voted remaining in the European Union. So baby boomers were essentially more nationalist, nostalgic for independence, but younger people like us consider themselves citizens of the global village. And to me, this meant that this heart for the global village is you here today, it's us. We, as young people, are the global citizens that will carry forth the collaboration, the diversity, inclusion, tolerance around the world. Um, and when you look at the numbers, with more than 7 billion people are on Earth, 59%, 4.3 billion, are under the age of 34. It's impossible for the largest population on Earth to look solely to older generations to fix, fix the challenges that await us. Um, between the ages of 15 to 24, we are 1.2 billion people. And we have to ask the question, where will these youth work? How will they be educated? What kind of citizens will they be? Who will they choose to be? How will they serve their nation? Who will they follow? 
Um, these are questions of tomorrow that all leaders and every nation must answer today. And the undeniable reality is our collective futures are critically linked. Um, this is why your role as, as future foreign policymakers and supporters is crucial. Um, let me maybe zoom into into my into my country, the United Arab Emirates. I'm proud to come from a nation that is making huge bets on young people today as our top investments in our future. The UAE believes youth are its most important asset, and we take pride in prioritizing youth development. Maybe Benjamin mentioned 49% of our population are under the age of 34, but we live in a region where more than 65% are under the age of 30 in the MENA region. The MENA region as a whole has the largest youth population in the world. And this comes with challenges, enormous opportunities. Our government recognizes that more than oil, youth are the energy that propels our nation and the world forward. So youth are leading us into a future that's more inclusive, that's more just, that focuses on holistic, humane approaches to economic growth and development. And to be honest, this extends just beyond even UAE borders to the YPFC, to the UAE embassies uh, partnership with YPFC, to the Y7. All of these are testaments to that. So now more than ever, I think we need to think globally and, and, and how can we co cooperate with one another? What are the ways that youth can positively and proactively contribute to creating a more global um, collaboration and improving diplomatic relations? The other question that comes to my mind is how can we as leaders also equip young people um, with the knowledge, with the skills they need to navigate uh, a world that is undergoing huge trans transformation? And just to go back to maybe the point Benjamin mentioned about foreign policy and youth, to be honest, in, in my four years in public service and, and kind of building an innovative youth platform in the UAE, there are three key parallels in foreign policy and youth, I think, that are interlinked. One is bilateral relations are essential. Two, um, results are important, not rhetoric. Three is inclusive solutions. So let me start with the bilateral or multilateral. Just as nations need bilateral and multilateral relations with one another to create a world that works, youth need strong bilateral and multilateral relations with decision makers. True effective policy can only be created when all stakeholders have a voice. And, and when every good leader and diplomat knows already that cooperation goes farther um, uh, than dis disengagement, than hubris, power plays, these bilateral and multilateral channels between government and between youth must be direct, must be multi-channels, and must happen often. They have a potential to impact the greatest number of people. So policymaking that has diversity at its core will result in societies that work for everyone. The second about results and rhetoric, I think. Both youth and foreign policy must be about results. It must not be about rhetoric. Many people join the debate about how future generations will be shaped by the rapid global dynamics. This is terrific, don't get me wrong. But who is, who is joining the doing to fully empower young people to shape the world that they will find themselves leading and even living in? Who is going beyond rhetoric? We all know rhetoric is language that's designed to be persuasive, to be impressive. But it's often regarded as lacking in sincerity and lacking, to be honest, in meaningful content. So here's the reality. Youth policy without youth participation in creating that policy is subpar. And youth policy without youth voice is rhetoric. The world does not need more rhetoric on youth. The world truly needs governments that empower young people to shape the futures that they will themselves inherit. And, and I think that the time is now. Positive disruption is possible. And youth engagement, just like foreign policy, goes beyond rhetoric. It points to inclusion. So my third, maybe last point, is um, in, look, look at inclusion as a verb. And including youth in policy making creates hope because this makes us feel like we, first of all, that decision makers listen to us um, and that we matter and that action also happens. So I'm talking about inclusion not for the sake of checking the diversity box, saying, hey, we included youth. But I'm talking about inclusion not as a noun, but as a verb. So what does that mean? It means to think um, about inclusion as a verb means basically that listening is the bridge to creating that kind of inclusion. Inclusion is about taking the humble posture of listening first, about removing assumptions, about learning from the other person, finding the common kind of vision that paves the way for common ground. It's about creating a place for those not like us 
and we will realize that they're more like us than we think. And this is the power of foreign policy, the power to cast inclusive bridges and build bridges to the reality. So I think that foreign policy can be a great vehicle of hope, and youth are part of this hope and light. Um, to be honest, this is why foreign policy needs youth. More youth participation, more youth voices, more youth involved, more youth included, and I can't wait to see a world with the diverse, humane dynamism of young people at the helm. And the world needs more of YPSP youth um, to be shaping our tomorrow today. And with that, Benjamin, I look forward to our discussion. Thank you for what an uh, engaging uh, kickoff to this introduction. I'm, I'm really grateful to your opening remarks. Uh, I have a couple of questions to start this conversation with, and then we'll switch over to the Q&A from our audience. Thanks, so thank you so much. So the four tracks of this summit, global connectivity and trade, energy, peace and security, and the future of education and jobs, are aligned with many of the priorities of your office. What are some of your key objectives as the Minister of Youth, and how are you using your platform to achieve these goals? So the Federal um, Youth Authority in the United Arab Emirates mission is basically to connect youth to every policymaker and decision maker that shapes their future. And every day we work hard to make that mission a reality. So the voice of youth shapes every sector of policy and society. We operate like an orchestra conductor, if I may use that metaphor, connecting youth to decision makers and channels in all aspects of economic and even civic society. Uh, for so many people, when you look at the youth sector, it looks messy, it's complex, it's unknown, it's overwhelming. Why is that? Well, because you look at young people between the ages of 15 to 35, they go through so many different transitions and different milestones. Some are in education, some are in the workforce, some are starting a family. And when you have a, a ministry of youth or a federal youth authority or an, a, a federal kind of government arm that coordinates all that work and all these transitions, all that kind of noise becomes music. So our approach is to put youth at the helm of leading their own strategy and to holistically address policy for them in every area that they touch, which is everything. Um, we are, in a sense, a design theory startup in every sense of the word. Um, let me give you maybe a, just a, a brief background. Um, before 2016, there was no cross-sectoral policy framework specifically for young people in the UAE. But in 2016, the UAE government disrupted the status quo and did something that is different to be part of the solution, uh, both in our home and even in our neighbors. So our mandate and objective was to institutionalize the entire youth sector and oversee its governance transformation. We basically unsiloed youth from sports sector and made youth strategy and policy part of all public and private sectors. So we've established over 60 um, initiatives and councils and platforms to ensure uh, youth engagement happens every day, um, to connect youth directly and continuously and substantively uh, with government. We anchored youth ecosystems through physical spaces, youth hubs and youth centers, and we started launch paths um, to catapult youth startups into the global supply chain. Um, we've held bilateral conversations between youth and decision makers. And, and as you mentioned, we've opened an Arab Youth Center that truly creates platforms where um, it's a direct response to what, what youth need in the Arab world. Um, today, when I look at that, um, it's, it's not only about involving youth, but also ensuring that youth have a seat at the table. And just to a, a few of the themes that you mentioned, whether it was global trade or connectivity, um, we work on a lot of initiatives on them. So if, if I look at the future of work and education, um, this theme is undoubtedly one of the most anxiety-inducing topics for youth in the Arab world and beyond. Our region has 30% unemployment rate um, outside of the Gulf countries. The outlook for youth uh, and their future economic pros prospects is burnt. Um, the UAE sees the youth bulge as an opportunity to tap into the demographic dividend and afford youth the opportunity to fully participate. For one, one of our initiatives is Emirates Youth Professional School, which prepares youth um, for the labor market with global competitive skills. And the content of the courses, um, which I think is unique, is fully developed by the school and reflects the needs and demands and trends in the market. Um, this is on, on the one hand. On peace and security, um, really, I think, None of the above themes that you mentioned is possible without actively investing in peace and security measures involving youth. So our country, the UAE, and the Gulf in general, um, is seen as an island of um, stability in a sea of instability in, in the Middle East. But peace is not simply the absence of, of conflict. Um, it is the presence of systems and policies that protect and uplift every member of society. 
that create really the conditions for stability, which in turn supports kind of the initiatives we, we lead um, in the youth sector. Um, and I'll give you a couple of examples. The UAE's Hedaya Institute had a conference on counter-violence, extremism, empowering youth to promote tolerance and end policies in that realm. As part of our, our federal youth authority strategy, we believe in the holistic development uh, that begins at the root, at youth character, at youth values. And if we can instill values like tolerance, like coexistence, and teach young people to critically think about why difference is often seen as a source of conflict instead of collaboration, then we are well on our way on our way to a peaceful society. Uh, we have so many other initiatives. Um, one is the Emirates Youth Global Initiatives, which includes kind of global programs, internships, um, and, and uh, other exchanges that really encourage youth in a bid to share our local values with the world. And youth are playing a key role in the upcoming Abrahamic House in Abu Dhabi, which will house uh, worship for Muslims, Christians, and Jews on one plot uh, of shared land. Basically, to, to conclude, uh, each initiative we have is in this vein, chips away um, at the idea that because we are different, we cannot work together or peacefully side by side. We know we don't have all the answers. Uh, but creating an environment where everyone is made to feel welcome and where there is a zero tolerance for discrimination against against people uh, based on their differences. Wonderful. You have a strong record of elevating diverse and representative voices throughout the UAE. What are some of the challenges of reaching and sharing underrepresented voices? Um, on underrepresented voices. Um, to be honest, I think the single greatest challenge is simple. It's listening. When people think of the United Arab Emirates, they often think of its diversity. We are home to over 200 nationalities who live, work, worship peacefully. Uh, and that diversity has resulted in such positive outcomes for our society from the beginning. Uh, under the late Sheikh Zayed, um, the UAE prioritized core values of tolerance and collaboration across religion, across nationality and ethnicity. And for years, we have contributed to global conversations about diversity and power of collaboration. But we learned that listening to people of many diverse backgrounds is critical to creating peaceful and prosperous coexistence. Make no mistake, diversity is hard work. It is hard, consistent work that requires humility, it requires radical empathy, and the continuous commitment to listen. And maybe just thinking of this challenge, I remember Angela Davis, um, the famous um, author, and, and I think she mentioned, um, I don't remember the quote, but I, I recall she said, you have to act as if it was possible to radically transform the world and you have to do it all the time. And I think what, what, what is special about what she said is there has to be consistency in our approach for inclusion. Uh, and that consistency is the key to transforming our, the world around us into a more just and inclusive place. So the UE has had to be intentional in creating initiatives that deliberately include marginalized or underrepresented voices, just like you mentioned. And this can only happen through first with listening. So with young people, we listen all the time. I, to be honest, hold myself as a chief listening officer. And I believe we need um, every leader to be this. And I want to illustrate uh, maybe two examples where we're innovating to represent underrepresented. Um, one is the Special Olympics UAE. It taught me, uh, being part of that team, it taught me about the power of hope and determination. Um, last year, we held the World Games for the first time in Abu Dhabi. And the theme song of the Special Olympics week was right where I'm supposed to be. That, this maybe title of that song, um, there's a power in affirming that people whose voices have historically been ignored really do belong within our society and should be treated with the same dignity and importance as everyone else. Now, the National Games of Special Olympics, which are going to be held every year in the UAE, are a celebration of people with intellectual disabilities. And we call them in the UAE people of determination. Even the terms we use are inclusive and positive as a way to kind of tackle the stigma around various disabilities. So the, ch the challenge really in making um, such initiatives a success is being intentional every step of the way. And the question that we need to ask ourselves is, are those voices being heard as a group of similarly marginalized but different individuals not one homogenous group. Um, the second question would be, are we going beyond listening and doing the work 
of creating both the physical and professional education spaces that make those courses hurt. So trust is built over time and in small and grand gestures. And if those that are marginalized cannot trust us to show up and do what we said we'll do, we will lose them and it will truly be our loss. I think the second maybe example is in the youth field. And um, we're also thinking about how do we reintegrate and rehabilitate um, juvenile detainees. Unfortunately, experiences like incarceration, uh, incarceration um, create a stigma and a stuckness for young people who then struggle with reintegration into society after release, and they're not given the space to find their new path again. We believe in the way that every young person, no matter their background or means, has something to offer the world and society. And my job is to help create the environment and portfolio of policies that enable those young people to live with dignity and reach their full potential. And, and finally, I think listening to potentially conflicting voices is as important as listening to the underrepresented voices that you mentioned, Benjamin. I think the posture of humility, empathy, and mutuality is one and the same. And these qualities are really important for the work of the nations globally. Wonderful. Thank you for that. The creation of a Ministry of Youth is a step in the right direction to increase diversity and inclusion in government. How is the UAE's government integrating youth perspectives and priorities into policy? Uh, uh, Benjamin, you've, you've really hit the nail on the head. This is something that we um, pride ourselves in. For the last four years, um, we have worked to do exactly that, to integrate and institution, institutionalize youth perspective priorities and ideas into government policy. And it is, I believe, the hallmark of the Federal Youth Authority and the work we've done We've set the table where youth can have a voice and a process to really share that voice. Youth to government, government to youth, youth to entities, entities to youth. And I want to tell you about a few, a few key outcomes of our efforts, not just the efforts themselves. We first set up a youth retreat um, directly with our nation's leadership to listen to youth needs, challenges, and ideas. And the outcome of that retreat was our national youth strategy, which was completely done by youth and for them. It addressed needs during uh, young people's key life transitions, including education, marriage, work, lifestyle, and, and exercising citizenship. And we empowered young people to author their own agenda. To me, this is an act of radical hope. The second is we've created these bilateral channels, if you will, of discussions between youth and decision makers establishing youth as important stakeholders in the process and outcomes of policy making. So this matrix of youth councils at the federal, um, uh, state level, local level, even global level, as well as um, our youth circles and several platforms prepare and provide youth with a direct two-way communication and conversation. These really bilateral vehicles that we've designed broke down the barriers between youth and national global decision makers from our, our, our prime minister to global leaders like Francis, Prince, uh, President Macron and um, Crown Prince of Jordan, former Prime Minister Theresa May, and former IMF Chair Christine Lagarde. And these youth circles that were global were extremely popular and they produced powerful outcomes. In some instances, youth, youth circles created new uh, tables. I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, one of the youth circles on housing with the federal ministry that's responsible for housing led to the UAE cabinet approving a youth housing awareness policy. It was a policy that aims to um, raise awareness and provide young people with a host of information on the different stages um, to build their house. It created a youth a one -on one course, essential references for, your, for future house owners um, and reliable instructions, et cetera, on how to basically an orientation box for, for youth. Um, another very important objective that came out of youth circles were several policies that really changed young people's lives. Um, and to be honest, the ecosystem of all the platforms that we've created really led to initiatives and programs that um, have taken up the mantle of this kind of done by youth leadership model um, to continue to ensure that youth reach their full potential. Um, if you look at climate change, uh, the Ministry of Climate Change in UAE deployed their youth council to bring ideas and leadership and innovation to domestic and even international initiatives. They've created um, the UAE Green Agenda 2015-2030. Um, these young people also co-piloted the UAE's National uh, Climate Change Action. There's so many more um, initiatives, the list goes on, and I think uh, it's beautiful to see um, a true 
and tangible outcomes that come from engaging young people. Lovely. Thank you for that response. I really appreciate the intentionality that you brought on, on how to incorporate youth voices in every step of the way. Um, how does your office engage bilaterally or multilaterally with other ministers of youth to progress the global goal of elevating youth voices in government? Um, we understand that we are only as strong as our neighbors. And therefore, building youth capacity across the entire region is a priority for all of us. The Federal Youth Authority is a fundamental believer in collaboration across borders with ministers and other prominent youth leaders in government. Bilateral and multilateral cooperation are the backbone of peaceful, progressive, regional, and global relations. And we're constantly learning from our counterparts around the world, like I'm now, um, to enhance the work that we do. And let me give you maybe a few examples of um, the UAE and, and the MENA region. In the region, we've decided to walk the talk of youth inclusion through the Arab Youth Center in Abu Dhabi, through its collaboration with several Arab state governments. First and foremost, the center's portfolio publishes research in the Arab world to drive policy and hosts other initiatives to really get youth ideas closer to the corridors of power. Um, it established uh, channels for youth to connect directly with their decision makers. We've hosted uh, first direction um, uh, really conversations with the Sudanese leadership, youth um, through Sudanese youth forum that we've created to share their aspirations and goals with their leadership, helped address so many pressing challenges they face. If we go to Jordan, we did um, a youth debate on university and vocational education with his Highness and His Royal Highness um, Crown Prince Hussein um, uh, bin Abdullah II. We've done youth circles with his Crown Prince Federation on uh, truly engaging young people and understanding their role in community development. We've done youth pitches uh, where youth can share their innovations designed to empower women in the workplace. Um, in Kuwait, we've um, hosted the Arab Youth Festival to bolster youth identity. When we go to Saudi Arabia, the Arab Youth Center um, worked on an imperative a strategy for youth engagement in, in, in the nation's social and economic development. And to be honest, during Ramadan last month and during COVID pandemic, uh, the center ran an Arab youth hackathon to create youth-driven solutions for fighting COVID-19 um, and other global crises. I think we are really celebrating winners and partnering with strong institutions to help us implement the solutions, particularly in categories like food and drug security, the employment and economy, education, healthcare, national and social responsibility. I can't say enough, Benjamin, how proud I am of these dreamers that become doers almost overnight. These are just a few of the initiatives we're doing to promote and practice youth engagement through the MENA region. But I just want to say maybe one thing. Elevating youth voices in government is indeed a global mandate. Uh, we started it at home, and we continue to branch out regionally and internationally to make sure that the lessons we've learned in the United Arab Emirates are shared across borders and that we remain open to learning from our youth counterparts around the world. Incredible. Thank you. That's really, really wonderful to hear, especially the uh, immediate response to the COVID hackathon work. That's really, really um, impressive. Uh, one of your hallmark achievements is the creation of youth circles, consultative town hall style meetings for youth to explore significant issues in the UAE. They strike me as a highly effective way of engaging and amplifying youth voices throughout your country. Can you talk about how you created this program and the key takeaways you've noticed from its implementation? So Youth Circles, first of all, was an idea that, that was born by youth. They've combined the ancient Bedouin tradition of sitting in a circle um, with the Maverick's new kind of government style of connecting directly to youth. It is really powerful and brilliant in its simplicity. When I look at the impact, of youth circles. We have bridged the gap between government and youth by simply creating a channel in which both youth can connect with government and voice their concerns, and government can listen to the needs and suggestions of youth. The outcome here is unique. Innovative perspectives, better services, more informed and really relevant policies and decisions. We have mainstreamed the concept of youth circles as a best practice platform for youth engagement across various sectors and, and entities and supported their organic development throughout the UAE. We've hosted international youth circles to engage youth globally and showcase best practice to the world. But I want to say this, youth circles is not just a dialogue of words. 
It's a dialogue of actions that reflect our commitment to serving youth better, to ensuring that they reach their full potential. And one of our youth circles uh, really that focuses on the themes um, of Y7 was recent. It was on jobs and employment. And it's focused on something we really all know. The best governments are going to be the early adopters in the infrastructure and readiness to upskill youth quickly and effectively to meet global market demands. So the UAE wanted to be one of the best in the world at doing this. So we needed youth's voice and ideas and leadership along the way. Um, and I remember that youth circle on job and education and jobs, jobs of the future. Um, we understood that youth are the ones on the front lines in the workforce assessing what skills are needed. So the question that we heard young people answer was which skills, training, opportunity, needs are met and which ones do they feel are unmet? What would they like to experience in the process of upskilling? How can our government help them do that? The Federal Youth Authority is proud to have launched the Emirates Youth Professional School, which was a physical and online um, now because of COVID, um, to build a platform basically to build youth um, skills in the future. Um, I want to also mention one of the key outcomes of youth circles, a tangible ones, where effective policy changes that have truly come from youth circles. I'll, I'll just talk about two uh, policies that I think really affected youth life and transition. One was the youth information policy, which launched out of the youth circle, and youth really wanted it. It basically addresses the most basic needs um, of youth from their government, getting information. Um, and getting information and giving information um, that shapes their decisions. When we have more and better information as youth, we make better decisions. That's very clear. We become better partners and hold our leaders accountable. So young people today are at best informed of policies decided by adults. Our policy here aims to provide information related to each of our young people's five major transitions in life, which cover basically different youth development, starting with information and demand like national youth policies, employment strategies, health strategies, gender policy, and basically customized information for youth, particularly at, at risk of social inclusion. Um, the second powerful policy was the youth participation policy which enables youth to really serve as key participants in every government sector and ultimately um, uh, every decision that affects their life. This policy uh, um, is mission is basically to empower youth with full autonomy um, and authority to inform, consent, and co-create with government on its importance um, uh, uh, of understanding really the impact of participation and institutionalizing youth participation um, and, and really requiring internal changes in government bodies. That's, that's, that's really why we want all youth policies to reflect how committed the UAE is to innovate, not only uh, our 21st century socioeconomic need, but also how do we do that and who do we do it with? Excellent, thank you. Um, so that, that's the, all of my five three questions, so thank you so much for answering. There's quite a lot of activity from our audience members, so I'm gonna jump to their questions. Thank you all for uh, submitting what you have so far. It's, Really great to see your engagement um, in this fireside chat. Okay, so our first audience question. What are the biggest successes that you have seen in the UAE that other countries, specifically the G7 countries, should consider adopting to promote the success of their youth? Um, one of the biggest successes, I think, is inclusion. Inclusion is huge, and it's necessary, and it's motivating, and in sometimes even life-saving for youth. I'll flip the question. Um, because it, 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 it's important to understand why is it successful. When you think of the question, why does, what, or what does it mean when governments create structures where youth can share their voice and their value, i.e. youth are included? It means that decision makers hear directly from their youth about their needs, about their challenges, about their ideas. It means youth feel empowered to take ownership about their own future in a co-creative kind of or co-creation method with those decision makers. And that union, I think that, that the UAE maybe started out in 2016, created data-driven policies, programs, and initiatives directly for youth by youth. To me, the success is it created hope. Just like um, I mentioned maybe a while ago, including youth in policymaking creates hope because they know we listen, and, and they know that they matter, and that action happens. So meaningfully including youth creates really um, the action that makes hope possible. And best news is hope begets hope. The hope of inclusion that meets action creates a firmer case for youth to trust that they are valued, and it also proves to the nation that youth are valuable assets. And I think this is 
what the UAE is doing. Um, and this is one of the things that I think is successful. Hope and love occupy the same place, and we need to invite them. Um, it's, um, it's, it's looking at youth, basically, in a way where the UAE sees um, that hope is born out of inclusion. And our country is a nation like no other. We're calling on our MENA neighbors to join us in this powerful path of inclusion that leads to hope, especially in a region like this with this youth bulge that has several challenges, but really opportunities. So I think the reality is to create that kind of success is the interval between creating that hope and when that outcome happens and what's going to happen in between. Um, and as young people, we are impatient and we just like waiting. Um, so it's important to ensure that you feel this kind of hope um, because it is a way of avoiding the uncertainty and the discomfort of uncertainty that we face in this world that is uncertain. Wonderful, thank you. Um, is the, in the UAE, is climate change an important topic for young people? And if so, how do you try to engage youth's voice in this huge task to combat climate change? Um, climate change is one of the most important um, uh, topics in the UAE. First of all, confronting and mitigating and adapting to climate change is one of the most massive undertakings of our time. I think we know the reality that confronting really climate change is like turning the Titanic. Um, it's like big shifts and the earth takes time um, a, a runway and coordinated effort to change its course. And failing to use the time we have to mitigate, innovate, adapt, uh, 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 climate change guarantees mutual assured destruction. So I want to just mention why am I mentioning this metaphor. Um, the difference is that the with the Titanic is we couldn't see the iceberg hazard beneath the water. But today with climate change, we can see the hazards ahead of us. And we have less than 10 years to make a hard turn. It requires massive coordination, commitment, and courage of conviction. Now, this is essential hope of youth. Why? Because climate, first of all, climate action requires we step beyond the business as usual. And youth do not bring the baggage of business as usual to the table. Youth bring the business of possibility and without the interests that limit progress to protect. So I'll tell you a bit about what we are doing in the UAE. The UAE, of course, pledges its full support in climate action goals and is going all in to empower youth to lead the way. We're placing big bets on clean energy and youth energy. With 49% uh, of our population under the age of 35, uh, we are abundantly rich in youth. Six years ago, the Abu Dhabi hosted uh, the preparatory climate change meeting of um, 2014 and also last year. At last year's meeting, the UAE and the United Nations ensured that youth were front and center. It sets the stage for all nations' climate action steps going forward. Our climate change minister, His Excellency Dr. Thani, launched the Emirates Youth Climate Strategy, which basically provided an integrated framework to enhance the role of youth domestically and internationally in meeting the challenges of climate change in accordance with the government's approach to develop empowered future generations. To be honest, our Ministry of Climate Change and Environment has been an absolute trendsetter in involving youth in every phase of its leadership and execution on climate action policy and initiatives. And to, and to be frank, this is the spirit of radical governance and radical youth engagement that really turns big shifts. There's so much more initiatives I can talk about from the UAE Green Agenda or the Emirates Youth Climate Strategy, but I just want to give you kind of an overview. Excellent. Um, a major part of another question, a major part of why youth feel disenfranchised from participating in politics and policy creation is because they believe that greater information and or education is necessary in order to make an impact or statement regarding specific sectors or policies. Do you have any current ideas or plans regarding the education of individuals or how to overcome this barrier? Um, this is so powerful. I think the equation here is very simple. Governments, um, if they don't engage you or create authentic information challenges with you, it creates a vacuum of unempowered youth, i.e. unempowered with information. And this vacuum will fill itself with something else. And I think it's, a, it's about time that, that governments kind of take another strategy. Let me use an analogy in the ca camera industry. If we look at Kojak, Kojak does an empire selling zone. And they saw digital coming. They responded by saying, we're a company that sells film. They did not adapt. And they 
even when they tried, it was too late. Cameras went digital. Today, we have cameras in our phones. Kodak caught on too late, and they filed for bankruptcy. When you look at Canon or Nikon, they made films and cameras, and they also saw the digital coming, but they invested in digital cameras. And their big pivot was a huge risk, was costly, was uncomfortable, and now they are a huge force in digital. Why am I using this metaphor? Governments who do not inno innovate to fully engage youth with information are at a great risk of taking the path of Kodak. The UAE took um, the direction of Nikon. We took big and costly risks with youth, and we will continue to place our biggest bets on youth. We're also doing so with women, by the way. But the youth bulge, it's like digital photography. It's coming, and it's already here, and governments living in an analog world are destined for failure. We have to adapt or we either fail. And adapting by providing youth in, with information is crucial. Just to, to give you an example, uh, part of uh, the Federal Youth Authority strategy is we believe in holistic development and information. And this begins at the root by ensuring that youth have enough information, but also how can we invest in youth character and values uh, with information that's powerful, like tolerance, coexistence, and inclusion, teaching youth to really think critically about why difference is often seen as a source of conflict instead of collaboration, then we are going to be on our way to a peaceful society. Excellent. This next question fits the same theme as well. What advice would you give countries that want to include youth but haven't yet? Um, one of the, I think, most important um, decisions is, I I'm not saying we are the model, um, uh, or the best model. I'm just saying that the UAE is really on a path that is unprecedented um, and on so many levels. It's not just youth inclusion or women inclusion. But I want to I want to talk about one of the uh, one of the most important maybe um, innovations that the UAE is focusing on with respect to inclusion, and it's something that relates to really tolerance, but also um, it's um, it's even more powerful than that. The UAE really discovered that radical inclusion um, creates real hope, and hope, hope generates the results that open doors for, for more wider inclusion. Including youth uh, is simple. It's about governments taking the responsibility to say, we care about these young people, we need to include them, creating authentic channels. We talked about listening. You can't include anyone without listening. So whether you're including youth or women or any kind of maybe underrepresented voice, one advice is start by engaging with them and ensuring that you have radical empathy by stepping in their shoes. To talk about maybe our experience with youth, Youth Circles was one of the platforms because it created a dialogue where we sat and listened. Um, I know sometimes you might say you're just saying a simple, simple kind of word. When you look at the Chinese character of listen, it has the character um, of uh, an ear and a heart and number one. And to me, that's powerful because it says, my heart is with you, but also there's this oneness. And that's radical empathy. I think that, that all governments and leaders must ensure that they take that kind of grassroots initiative. Phenomenal. Thank you for that. Uh, how does your office envision the future of global connectivity for young people after the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic, especially for youth who do not have access to technology? I think it's, it's crucial that um, governments start to really collaborate together. Global problems require global collaboration. Um, I think we are um, lucky in the United Arab Emirates to truly come from a nation that is making it or, or being on the path and trying to run the race of humanity well by ensuring that we do our part. Um, when you look at what the UAE has done, um, especially with COVID and helping other nations, I think um, it's inspirational. Um, just to, to see how the UAE responded, we acted through the power of example, through diplomacy, through intensive assistance programs. Our response to this health crisis illustrates the approach, and I'll give you a few examples. To date, the UAE responded to COVID-19 by providing over 641 metric tons of aid to 54 countries in need, supporting more than 641 thousand medical profession, professionals in this process. The UAE is working with the World Health Organization to combat the virus and, and support countries in need. 
Today, the, the Dubai International Humanitarian City houses the WHO's Operations Supply and Logistics Hub, which is a facility that is instrumental in supplying countries with required medical supplies and protective equipment. But as a, as a conclusion, everything we do, but even especially in diplomacy and, uh, and, and maybe assistance, the UAE has been guided by its very sounding uh, through a deeply kind of uh, a held belief that we are stronger united than apart. And COVID-19 is testing our global society in every way by working across borders to combat the best of humanity's ingenuity, fortitude, and kindness. And we will defeat this virus and improve our preparedness together. On that same vein of the pandemic, do you think this current pandemic will drive youth participation into policymaking? For sure. Um, I think we already see it um, around the world with the dialogue, with the reason, um, with the different conversations that are happening. Um, it's beautiful to see how youth are, their voices are being amplified, but make no mistake, I'm not seeing it as the way everyone kind of 10 years ago looked at youth as problem, or that youth have kind of this, this high screaming kind of voice. It's not apathy or hopelessness, but it's, it's voice with reason, um, the voice with a heart of inclusion, one tolerance. Today we see that everyone stands around together um, so closely, and regardless of what's happening around the world, I'm saddened by uh, different things that people are experiencing um, the pain, whether it's, it's COVID. I think um, we all are mourning the lives of so many people that, that were lost due to COVID. Um, and I think as our hearts really are open from the shockwaves of COVID-19, um, there's the impacts of racism and, and injustice. It really has awakened our world like never before. And um, youth are the ones who are really calling for progressive needs to be more pragmatic. Um, and I think governments need to listen. We all need to use our hearts as much as our heads. We need a global society of young people, of global citizens, who will make it uh, their mission to make these issues the center of their mission and their work. And, and YPFC is, is an example, maybe, and a testament to that. I just want you to know that at the Federal Youth Authority, we are committed to doing our part to learn and build diligently for a fully inclusive um, UAE and world. Uh, and one of YPFC's chapters is in Dubai, so it's a, a wonderful way to continue this engagement process. I appreciate you saying that, but also the importance of, of how we collaborate and continue to engage multilaterally is it, it, forever changing as a result of the pandemic, so thank you for, for your comments on that. Uh, there's quite a lot of questions in this chat, and we'll, we'll be able to get some more. I just wanted to let everyone know that uh, we're going to continue this conversation right now. Just very exciting and, and energetic responses in the chat. Thank you for your time. and your energy in, in chatting with us. Um, in your an opening comments about Brexit, a, a lot of uh, excitement about that specific example that you use. Um, so in regarding to the minister's reference to the older youth split in the Brexit referendum, what strategies would you advise to strengthen the youth, vote, youth voice when we're confronted by such a clear age split on a policy issue? What tactics will you suggest for youth that cross age boundaries and influencing generations of people much older than us? I think um, it's not about more what tactics. I think youth have the tools. Um, the reality needs to be clear for decision makers. With the world changing at breakneck speed, our systems not being able to meet all of the needs of youth around the world, the reality is clear. It's now up to governments to create new paths for youth. I know we're lucky in the UAE because our leadership takes this seriously and we believe that we must have the courage to question our paths with young people, and that governments need to examine and re-examine the status quo uh, from youth who are vulnerable to extreme violence, to youth that are vulnerable to apathy, poverty, mental health challenges. Our leaders understood that governments must create positive paths for youth to pursue them. It is vital to our national success and regional um, security. Uh, I think it, it's time now for programs that really focus on young people to understand um, how can we ensure that these leaders understand that youth are the most important asset because the numbers are so clear. Youth under 35 make up 59% of the world's population, 65% of the MENA region. 
in every case, at least half of our population today is 100% of our tomorrow. So youth are a critical component to the equation. And I think it's up to youth and to nation leaders to shift the trajectory in how they engage their young people. Um, and how do they empower them in a maverick way? Um, to be honest, in the UAE, what was interesting, and I think this might apply to a lot of nations, it was always youth and sports. Always, it's ministries of youth and sports, mostly. To be honest, it's an outdated mindset and practice. Without a doubt, sports, sports are proven to positively impact youth health, youth education, youth social development, and bolster community, country, and individual. Yes, sport is just one of many vital components in youth development. We are here talking about developing people's well-rounded capabilities, aspirations to reach their full potential, their best suited careers, their healthiest mind, bodies, and spirits, their top values as citizens, their true purpose as human beings. We are lucky to have leadership that state and believe that it's no longer to, to see or it's no longer even sufficient to see young people as anything less than the most valuable asset and address their needs in every part of their lives. And I think we need more of YPSP leaders to voice that in the, G in, in the G7 and in other kind of nations that really need that kind of outlook. Absolutely, wonderful. Um, how do you avoid engagement with youth only being from the most privileged and fortunate aspects of society? That's a very good question. That relates back to the point of inclusion. We have several platforms that ensure that we're not only listening to those who are engaged. So one example um, is our youth councils. Our youth councils are basically the most elite leaders. They are spectacular and phenomenal. Young people who are already want to be engaged, who want to serve their nation, who are stellar um, in, in whether they're, it's their virtual CD or, or resume or their credentials or capabilities. But well, we've created platforms, one of them, of course, is Youth Circle, but we also go to those who are unengaged and try to listen to their voice. I think when you look at um, youth, the youth sector, people think sometimes, oh, you cluster youth as one group. No, youth who are in school are different. Their challenges are different from youth maybe who are in university, or youth who are in rural uh, places are different from youth who are in the city. Um, a gender dynamics. Um, youth who are, who are dropouts from school, juvenile youth, all these young people are different. So creating a youth strategy requires, and I think it's essential for all of us to understand that youth is not a homogenous group, and how do we address each one with a specific separate strategy? Excellent. I think that's, that's really, really um, important. So the inclusivity uh, angle is, is the only way to progress. So that's really helpful to hear that's a priority for you. Um, how is the UAE contributing to tackling mental health issues that the youth suffer from? I, I love the discussion of mental health because mental illnesses, to be honest, um, really um, is like being in a, in a dark room and there's no light and maybe there is um, no keys to the room. The fight for mental health is one of the most important battles of our time because how we think and feel determines everything that we do. Our brain's ability, Benjamin, to process our thoughts and emotions is at the root of every action we take. Making our brain a healthy command center is essential for us to live productive, purposeful, and fulfilling lives. So when you say we want to ensure youth reach their full potential, we need to understand that healthy individual brains determine the health of our collective brains, our communities, our nation, our world, are only as healthy as our mental health. As a human family, we need to pay attention, of course, to our emotional and psychological pain, just as we do uh, in our physical pain. Recently, I wrote uh, an op-ed love letter to you addressing these issues because the UAE just launched a mental health policy. And it's important that we know that none of us are alone in the battle for inner peace. And the UAE is com committed, really, to revolutionize our mental health care system through youth voices. We started with a youth dialogue on that, and our Minister of Happiness and Wellbeing is leading our mental youth uh, our mental health hotline. We have the opportunity, I think, globally through the COVID-19 to try new things. And I think the question is, as we all take vitamins to boost our physical immune system, the question is, what are the vitamins and actions we can take as young people to boost our emotional and psychological immune system? What are the habits that we choose and change that we can now use and, and kind of lay the groundwork for more enduring inner peace for our lifetime? I think pursuing a system designed for national mental health care is one of the UAE's top priorities, and I'm so encouraged that youth are not only open to pursuing um, this kind of level of inner peace, 
uh, and mental health support, but they are asking for it. And the Federal Youth Authority is committed to this kind of investment and has invited already young people to really share their ideas and share what they're challenged by and what, what are they experiencing. And this reflects, again, the bilateral relationship that governments must have with youth to meet their real problems with real solutions. Incredible. Thank you for that. It's a, a very, very, very pressing topic, and I, I really appreciate, again, your intentionality in, in responding, but also how the UAE is focusing on solving these issues. Um, a couple more questions. We are, we are wrapping up, but thank you again, audience, for all of your engaging, um, exciting questions. This has been a really phenomenal fireside chat, and I've, I've really enjoyed hearing your perspective. Um, how can we ensure that the voices of minors and those below voting age are heard in the political discourse? I think it's, it's very simple. Um, uh, it needs to start with leadership that, again, that believes in youth. Um, and I'll tell you a, a brief example, and I'm having that trouble. When we go to the United Nations during the ECOSOC, which is basically kind of the global gathering where all ministers of youth or even kind of teams of ministries of youth or, or youth authorities around the world meet, and sometimes it's youth and sports. When I'm there, I'm shocked at how the ministers of youth need to kind of lobby for youth engagement, lobby for even financing for youth programs. And it's, it's shocking because if half of your population are young people, how are you not investing in young people, in your assets? Whether it's minors or youth below the age of 15, I think it's crucial that everyone engages with decision makers and makes the case for them because sometimes they don't see how clear it is to really invest in young people. Um, uh, the question becomes, why are they resisting um, uh, uh, young people's investment? It, it's what you resist persists. Um, and when you see young people as in that kind of light, you are losing as a nation. Excellent. Um, do you think that youth engagement would someday find its way to countries with high levels of censorship? For sure. Um, I think it doesn't have to, um, uh, there shouldn't be fear of censorship or information. Right now, everything is at the hands um, of your phone. Yes, there is censorship and maybe especially related to, to maybe freedom of speech. Um, but, uh, but it's very interesting to, to think about how, um, how can youth even contribute to this debate um, in, in a positive light. It, I don't think so. these two things are even um, linked. Uh, it doesn't really kind of, and it doesn't, for me, um, ring a bell of, of kind of a conflict here. Incredible. Um, so this is a little bit more of a personal question for you, but how did you become the Minister of Youth? What was your career trajectory? Um, so that's a kind of funny coincidence. I, um, I was studying finance and, and um, economics um, at uh, New York University Abu Dhabi. And then I, I went to pursue my master's in Oxford um, in public policy. Uh, and after that, I wanted to go into financial economics and continue my graduate degree. But I decided to go back and work in one of the sovereign wealth, sovereign, sovereign wealth funds. Sorry, um, I'm very I'm, I'm passionate about bond trading and private equity um, since I was young. Um, I think if, if anyone in the audience has read Barbarian um, or, or knows about Solomon Brothers, you would understand the passion of finance fanatics. Um, but what, what was interesting was in 2016, His Highness uh, Sheikh Mohammed Barash, the Prime Minister of the UAE and the ruler of Dubai, asked, and via a tweet, um, asked people to nominate for a Minister of Youth. And at that time, I was working um, in, in the Sovereign Wealth Fund uh, in one of the largest leveraged buyouts deal of the year. Um, I remember it was February 2016. And I got a call because um, my university nominated um, me um, uh, to uh, the Prime Minister's office in the Ministry of Cabinet Affairs. What was interesting was I got a call with a lot of questions, and I was called for an interview to the Ministry of Cabinet Affairs um, in the UAE, which I didn't know much about. Um, and I left the interview going back to work um, and uh, continued life as normal. And then I got um, uh, shocked because I got a call. You have to check uh, Twitter. And I checked Twitter, and I got appointed via Twitter. So um, my previous even boss uh, didn't believe because uh, it, it was via, tweet, uh, via Twitter, his highness tweeted, I appoint XYZ as a minister of youth. 
Um, so yes, via a tweet. And our government is very progressive. We get hired and fired via Twitter. Mm -hmm. Wow, incredible. Um, so this is our, our five minute wrap up. So thank you so much for all of your questions, including the audience, just a, a wealth of knowledge that you have. Um, I mean, you are the same age as, as the majority of our Y7 delegates, as well as myself. And so I think it's incredibly inspiring to hear different ways of, of inclusive government, the, the projects that you've spearheaded, and, and having um, the diversity of your perspectives as a m member of the youth community at large in implementing change, not just in your country, but regionally. And I think the work you've done with the Special Olympics and the youth councils and, and, and all of the aspects of your, your tenure so far have been incredibly impactful and inspiring. And uh, I, I hope your record doesn't get beat as the youngest world minister, but maybe <laughs> that is a, is a good record for all of the countries on this audience to uh, try to try to, feed, try to beat, if possible. <laughs> I hope, first of all, I hope you do beat it because it's, it's good. <laughs> the more youth leaders we have, the more uh, progression and, and the more um, if this world is going to progress in unprecedented ways. First of all, I also want to thank you. I had a lot of fun talking to you all. Um, thank you for the great questions, this opportunity to share a glimpse of how the United Arab Emirates is empowering youth to create the kind of world that we all want to be part of. I also want you to know that I share and identify with the ideas and hopes and aspirations and frustrations of young people. I know how hardworking, kind, innovative youth um, have continued to be. Everyone watching today has exhibited bravery by showing up and choosing to be the solution to global issues that can sometimes feel insurmountable, Benjamin. And for that, I'm grateful. Um, each and every one of you will be continuing to some of the most um, really important policies and decisions around the world. And I hope you continue to contribute because in, in, in what will really prove to be an era when all of us will be stretched, tested, and will be subsequently um, grown to create a new normal. And maybe my parting words to young people today watching is throw yourself into a cause or a mandate that you're passionate about. Give wholeheartedly to it. Find the people who care about what you do. Find the people who disagree. Work with the first learn from the other, build bridges between them, and take small steps towards your goal every day. Expect painful learning curves, iterative solutions, and messy processes. Expect disappointment, expect triumph, um, step forward, step back. This is the work at the global level. It's, it's all the worthwhile. Just being part of an initiative like the YPSC is a bold step. Um, and if, if I may use maybe Brene Brown, our um, renowned um, author and shame researcher. She said, sometimes the bravest, I think, and the, and the most important thing to do is showing up. Um, and you here, you showing up um, is vital to our future. Uh, your voice, your uh, uh, volition matters deeply to our words. And, and just to, to end this, here's the current reality of why. Policy without youth participation is subpar governance. Um, policy without youth voice is, again, rhetoric. The world does not need more rhetoric or passive policies. The world needs governments that empower youth to shape the futures that they will inherit. The world needs a future that works. And the best futures to really uh, belong to those nations that best harness their youth potential. So I'm excited to see what we, all of us as young people, and our nations can do together today and in the years to come. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Your Excellency Minister Al Mazrui. This has been an absolutely enlightening, inspiring, and, and incredible kickoff to the Y7 Summit. I'm so grateful to your collaboration and engagement with YPSP, but also inspiring and connecting to our global audience. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, I wish you all the best as you continue to implement inclusive and diverse policies throughout the UAE and the multilateral agreements that you focus on. Thank you again. Thank you.